On the evening of November 18, 1987, police went to the mobile home of Russell Keith Dardine, 29, and his family outside Ina, Illinois, after he had failed to show up for work that day. There, they found the bodies of his wife and son, both brutally beaten. Ruby Elaine Dardine, 30, who had been pregnant with the couple's daughter, had been beaten so badly she had gone into labor, and the killer or killers had also beaten the newborn to death. The killings had apparently taken place the day before. Investigators at first believed that Keith was the prime suspect. The next day, however, his body was found in a nearby field. He had been shot and his genitals mutilated, his car was found parked near the police station in Benton. Forensic examination showed he had been killed within an hour of his family. Residents of Jefferson and Franklin counties, who were already fearful after more than 10 murders had taken place locally in the preceding two years, became even more so. Many armed themselves, some suffered adverse psychological effects. Rumors held that the killings were the work of Satanists, police soon ruled that out as well as other motives, most from illicit behavior such as drug dealing, marital infidelity, or gambling. But the crime scene also ruled out rape or robbery as associated incident crimes, and in the absence of any clear cause or leads the crime remained unsolved. Both Dardines went by their middle names. Keith, a native of Mount Carmel, bought the trailer in 1986 after completing the training required for his job as a treatment plant operator at the Rend Lake Water Conservancy District's nearby facility. Elaine, who was from Albion, a little closer to Ina, moved there later with their two-year-old son, Peter. They rented the land it sat on from a nearby farming couple. Keith worked, his wife found a job at an office supply store in Mount Vernon. When not working, the couple were part of the musical ensemble at a small Baptist church in the village. Keith sang lead vocals while Elaine played the piano. In 1987, Elaine became pregnant with the couple's second child. They had decided to name the baby either Ian or Casey depending on whether it was a boy or a girl. The pending addition to the family had led Keith and Elaine to strongly consider moving. By late in the year, they had put the mobile home up for sale. However, that was not the only reason for the move. According to Joanne Dardine, Keith's mother, he had said he would move back to Mount Carmel even if he were unable to find a job there before doing so, as he regretted ever having moved to Ina, telling her that the area was becoming too violent. There had been 15 homicides in Jefferson County during the previous two years, starting with those committed by Thomas Odell, a Mount Vernon teenager who had killed his parents and three siblings as they individually returned to the house one night in 1985. Though Odell, as well as some of those charged with murder in the other cases, had been convicted, residents of the rural area had become fearful and stressed. A friend of Keith said that, after a 10-year-old girl had been raped and murdered in the area in May 1987, Keith became so protective of the family that one night, when a young woman came by the mobile home asking if she could make a phone call, he refused to let her in. On November 18, Keith, who had been a reliable worker at the treatment plant, did not report for his shift. He had not called to inform his supervisor that he would be unable to come in, and calls to his house went unanswered all day. His supervisor called both of Keith's parents, who were divorced but still lived near each other in Mount Carmel. Neither of them knew what could have happened to their son. Don Dardine, Keith's father, called the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office and agreed to drive down to Ina with the house key and meet deputies at the home of his son and daughter-in-law. Inside they found the bodies of Elaine, Peter, and a newborn girl, all tucked into the same bed. Elaine had been bound and gagged with duct tape. Both had been beaten to death, apparently with a baseball bat found at the scene, a birthday gift to Peter from his father earlier that year. Elaine had been beaten so severely that she had gone into labor and delivered a girl, who soon met with the same fate as her mother and brother. Keith was not present, nor was his car, a red 1981 Plymouth. Investigators assumed he had killed his wife and children and was at large. A team of armed police went to his mother's house in Mount Carmel looking for him. 
The search ended late the following day, however, when a group of hunters found his body in a wheat field not far from the trailer, just south of the Franklin Jefferson County line, near Rend Lake College. He had been shot three times, his penis was also severed. The Plymouth was found parked outside the police station in Benton, 11 miles south of the Dardine home, its interior spattered with blood. News of the killings made area residents even more fearful than they had already been. Many residents began going about their daily business, with shotguns visible in their vehicle's gun racks. After high school basketball games, students would wait in the school building for their parents to come in and accompany them to the parking lot for their ride home instead of socializing outside as they normally did. Early reports from police about the crime were limited and sometimes contradictory, allowing rumors to spread. The two counties' respective coroners differed on whether Keith had died of a head injury or being shot. Among those who reported the former, it was said that it had been inflicted when he was dragged from a car. The circumstances under which Elaine gave birth, perhaps posthumously, to her short-lived daughter, gave rise to stories that Casey, as the family called her, had been ripped from her mother's womb. Along with the mutilation of Keith's genitals, this supported speculation that Satanists were active in the area and had performed a ritual sacrifice of the family. The crime was also posited to be the work, along with three other local unsolved murders, of a regional serial killer. Dr. Richard Gerritsen, a family physician who doubled as the Jefferson County Coroner, told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in early December that many of his patients talked to him about the case and how it had disturbed them. One man who said he lived a half-mile from the Dardines trailer told Gerritsen he was having difficulty sleeping and had lost 14 pounds as a result of the stress. Also unable to sleep was the Dardines' landlord's daughter, who told her parents years later that she kept her bedroom light on and read all night out of fear. Robert Lewis, the Franklin County coroner, felt much of the fear was unjustified. I don't think there is a rational basis for the near hysteria, he told the newspaper, the people are frightening each other. People were so afraid, he said, that if someone ran out of gas in the county he would not seek assistance in any nearby homes but would instead walk to the nearest highway and hitch a ride. Local police agencies joined forces with the Illinois State Police to investigate the crime. A total of 30 detectives worked full-time following leads and interviewing 100 people. None of what they found proved fruitful. A man taken into custody early on was released after being questioned, likewise, a co-worker of Keith's with whom he reportedly had been having a dispute was cleared. No one who knew the couple had anything bad to say about them. A small quantity of marijuana was found in the trailer, but not enough to suggest they were involved in dealing. Police even believed the marijuana might have been inadvertently left behind by the killer or killers. The autopsies found no drugs or alcohol in any of the victims. The coroners put the time of death for all the Dardines at within an hour of each other. The bodies in the trailer had been killed 12 hours before they were found, and Keith Dardine had been dead for 24 to 36 hours when he was found. Resolving this question, however, made it harder to determine how the crime had been committed, since Keith's body was found away from the trailer, and he may have been killed at that location rather than with his family. At the trailer, the killer or killers had apparently taken the time to not only tuck Elaine's body into bed along with her children's bodies, but also to clean up the scene, suggesting they did not feel any urgency to leave. The amount of effort involved led police to theorize that the crime may have taken place at night. The trailer was on Route 37, a busy state highway, but could be seen at the time from Interstate 57 almost 2,000 feet to the west. It was also an open question as to whether there was one killer or multiple. Determining the motive of the assailants was a particularly difficult part of the case. The back door had been left open, there was no evidence of forced entry. A VCR and portable camera were in plain sight in the living room. Elsewhere in the house equally accessible cash and jewelry remained. These facts argued against robbery as the motive. Elaine had not been raped or sexually assaulted. Police also found no evidence of any extramarital affairs involving either Keith or Elaine that might have motivated the other party to a jealous rage. 
A stack of papers with sports scores found in the house led them to wonder whether Keith might have incurred gambling debts. However, Joanne Dardine told police her son was so frugal that he raised money for his young son's college fund by reselling 50-cent cans of soda at work for a small profit. Despite the widespread fear the case engendered, Lewis, the Franklin County coroner, did not believe the Dardines were randomly chosen. I believe it was a very personal, deliberate thing, he told the Post-Dispatch. A police expert on cults told the newspaper that the rumor that Satanists were responsible was untrue, since such groups often would mutilate bodies more extensively, harvest organs, and leave symbols and lit candles at the scene of their crimes. None of these indications had been found at the Dardines trailer. Police did allow, however, for the possibility that, while the Dardines were chosen purposely, it may have been a case of mistaken identity by the killer or killers. Joanne Dardine said later that she had considered other motives someone might have had for killing her son and his family. I think someone wanted Keith to sell drugs and he refused, she said in 1997. Or there's a possibility someone liked Elaine and she wouldn't accept his advances and he took out his rage on both of them. We just don't know. Eventually, the police exhausted all leads and had to start working on other cases. Two FBI profilers came to the area to review the evidence. They were able to make some suggestions, but generally found that the crime defied their typical analytic methods. Joanne Dardine worked to keep the public from completely losing interest. Throughout the 1990s, she regularly called the one detective still assigned to the case, offering possible leads she had learned of, or asking for any new information he could share. She gathered 3,000 signatures from area residents on a petition to The Oprah Winfrey Show, asking producers to do a segment on the killings of her son and his family. They turned her down, saying the crime was too brutal for daytime television. America's Most Wanted had a similar reaction at first, but then changed its mind and ran a segment in 1998. The show did not generate any new leads. The investigation involved numerous law enforcement agencies, including the Illinois State Police. Despite the efforts of 30 detectives and interviews with 100 individuals, no fruitful leads emerged. The community lived in fear, and the case gradually faded from public attention. Even the involvement of FBI profilers yielded limited results. Keith's mother, Joanne Dardine, continued to actively seek justice throughout the 1990s, maintaining regular contact with the assigned detective and pursuing media coverage of the case. If you found this video intriguing, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more captivating content.